Are we managing kids' cognitive overload? We all have a cognitive overload issue. We have limited capacity. And if we give kids too much information at once, they don't get any of it. Um, are we teaching procedure with meaning? So we have all this informal stuff, and then we get them. What do we do with them? And I guess the question is, if you're a classroom teacher, or if you're in middle school, whatever, what did the people before do with them? What did these kids get who are migrants who are coming into my school in the middle of the year? What instruction did they have? So we have all these components, what they're born with, their informal experiences, their formal instruction, and then the last piece of this formula is their affect, their emotional state, how they feel. And when kids approach a task, one way to think about it, and the, these uh, uh, cognitive researchers now talk about sort of balancing resources and demands. When you encounter a task, you have the task, the demands, and then what do I have, what resources do I have within me, around me, to handle that task? And so when, it's, when the demands are really heavy compared to my resources, then kids go into cognitive shutdown. It's like, there's no way I can do that. And that tends to lead to stress. And I'm thinking about how hard the task is rather than actually doing the task. And the more energy I'm putting in to think, and you ha we do this all the time. When we look at our to-do list and we start fretting about how much we have to do rather than actually doing it. <clears throat> so when it's out of whack that way, then we have kids who are like, I can't do this. It's beyond me. When it's out of whack the other way, when the task is so easy compared to the resources we have, we're bored. Ah, I can do this with my eyes closed. I don't care. It's stupid. Um, so keeping them in balance is part of the game here. So when kids approach a task, how do they think about it? Are they in balance? Is this the right kind of task for me? Can I do this? And some of the things that enter into their thinking about it is their view of intelligence. Great work by Carol Dweck among others. Uh, I think people, I've heard that there's some buzz about it. It's been in some sessions here. Um, but the looking at, do kids think that I'm good at math because I was born good at math, or I'm good at math because I worked at it? And kids who have a view of fixed intelligence, I'm good because I was born with it, then if they can't do it, all it's doing is confirming, I'm just not good at math. And we hear this culturally. And what a horrible thing, in a sense, for parents to tell their kids, you know, I was never very good at math either. You know, it's just not me. Effort matters. If you believe that if I work at it, intelligence is incrementally built, my brain is like a muscle. The more I work at it, the stronger those neural connections get, then I will try. So it has a big effect on effort. Related to that is something called stereotype threat. <clears throat> People familiar with stereotype threat? <clears throat> it's this weird thing. My favorite example of stereotype threat is a study done by Aronson at Columbia. He went to a liberal arts school. There's a test, a spatial test, that, they, that um, men typically perform 25% better than women on average. And that's one of the things that people like Larry Summers pointed to to say, you know, maybe women aren't you know, in the sciences because they're just genetically not um, primed for it. They don't have that spatial thing going on. So they went and they did this little um, study at a liberal arts school, and half the students who took this, before they took this spatial test, were given a little demographic form to fill out. And on the demographic form included what's your gender, male or female. Those who did that <clears throat> performed according to the average. The men performed about 25% better than the women. The other half of the students who took this spatial test, before they took it, they didn't fill out anything about their demographics. They wrote a little thing about, a little essay about why they were at a high-performing liberal arts college. For those students, the gap between men and women pretty much disappeared. Is that freaky or what? Like, what happened there? And they have similar studies when people identify themselves as African American before a test. When they do, there's gender stuff. You tend to associate yourself with a group. And when that is primed, and it's often, it's totally subtle. This priming thing is really interesting. 
I'll give you one other example of priming, because it's a cool math thing. Um, they took people into, a, um, into an online auction on eBay. And before they went in, they had the, the participants identify themselves by the last two digits of their social security number. So totally random, right? I mean, it's just, you know, it's just the last two digits of social security number. <clears throat> Those people who whose last two digits were high, like nine zero, versus low, like zero nine, those that were high spent more on eBay, paid more for the same thing. So there's this whole priming thing that goes on that is totally subtle. They had a, their counter was set higher. And we see this stuff again and again. Marketers know this stuff. We in education could probably learn something from what marketers are doing to us all the time. Um, but the stereotype threat is something that's real. We tend to play to what we expect. And so people who think they're good at something will work harder because they want to maintain their self-image as good at it. If you think you're not good at it, why should I even try? Because I know I'm not good at it. 